I would like to introduce this call for discernment um, as one that is the most crucial call for all of Christianity worldwide. And I would like to do so by stating very briefly that before I was saved by the Lord, I was hopelessly lost in conspiracy theories. I was learning lots of truth, lots of things that are actually true. There are certain um, secret societies and things. There is something called the Illuminati. Uh, these things do exist. However, it's important to know the origins of them. For instance, lots of people do not know that Adam Weissart was a Jesuit. People do not know things like that. Uh, they're not interested. Men like Alex Jones will not discuss the Jesuits. Um, and unfortunately at the time, uh, I was not a Christian. I had no interest in Jesus Christ. And a great deal of what I was learning was just being spoon-fed me by lying New Age snake oil salesmen. Coming out of all kinds of bogus arguments about the Bible and just lots of other nonsense. I can now see, however, that I was living in a, a foolish arrogance by presuming that I would be free from all of all of the um, the lies once the Lord saved me. Um, indeed, um, there's more deception, I feel, within Christianity than outside. And the reason being is Jesus Christ is the truth and Satan is the father of lies. He has never stopped trying to kick up clouds of dirt to obscure the truth, and Christianity is far from exempt. Indeed, it appears that Satan's hardest work has gone into confusing Christianity, a sort of mimic of how God confused Satan's children at the Tower of Babel. Now, I'm making this video because the Lord has shown me the majority of Christians believe in two specific sets of doctrine which have been created absolutely by the children of the devil and are thus inspired by the spirit of our enemy. Now for most Christians the things I'm about to state and conclude upon will come as a surprise but I would ask you to not simply dismiss the facts I will present nor simply to believe everything I have said but rather pray to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that he would reveal the truth of these matters to you and guide you in all truth by the power of his Holy Spirit. I make no apology for presenting this information quite informally and unprofessionally. I want for you to examine the facts for yourselves. The Lord has shown me that as his children we can only ever be truly convinced of something if our Father has told us it is true. May God guide you in all truth. The Reformation is a title typically given to the movement that saw the providence of God sweep across Europe with men independently seeking to translate the Bible into native tongues. Ultimately the people were enlightened by this and broke free of the yoke of papal authority, persecution and blinding false doctrine. Before this were the, the Dark Ages which as one would expect by its name was a time in which Rome kept the masses blind with only certain priests being allowed to read the scriptures. No questioning of papal authority was allowed and of course before as well as after the Reformation if anyone were to be found translating the Bible or reading it illegally they were to be executed by the papacy. So the Reformation is absolutely crucial for all of Christianity. We have so much to be grateful for. Indeed, we should be praising God that we even have his word and that we can read it in peace. And yet so many people leave it on their shelves to collect dust. But it's the, the main debate of the Reformation. It's the main um, contradiction between the two parties that I want to examine here as we begin. In The Bondage of the Will, which was written by Martin Luther, he replied to the Roman Catholic scholar Erasmus, and Erasmus's diatribe, the freedom of the will. Though disagreeing 
with everything else Erasmus wrote. Luther at least commended Erasmus for recognizing that the, the crux of the matter at issue between Rome and the Bible believers was the debate over free will. In this regard, Luther wrote, but unlike all the rest, you alone have attacked the real issue, the essence of the matter in dispute, i.e. man's so-called free will and his salvation. You and you alone saw what was that grand hinge upon which the whole turned, and therefore you attacked the vital part at once, for which from my heart I thank you. And I thank him too, as it makes my job in this video that much easier, and it allows us to see Satan's scheming, so that we are not ignorant of his devices. And from this, we can see that the major factor of debate for the Reformation, as identified by Luther, was God's sovereignty, or man's free will in his salvation. Something resolved so brilliantly by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9, with verses such as, 15 and 16, which say, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. The papists were on the side of the free will of man in his salvation, and the Protestants were on the side of God electing us to salvation as we are told in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, with verses like 4 to 6. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The doctrines of free will, and the most common form of eschatology, held by the overwhelming majority of supposedly pro uh, Protestant denominations, were in fact given to the churches by the Vatican, through their militant arm, the Jesuits. I will now elaborate on this matter, but before we continue, it is necessary to identify who the Jesuits are, and their purpose. The Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, or Los Alumbrados, as it was originally known, which being interpreted is the Illuminati, was created by Ignatius Loyola in September of 1540. Loyola was the author of Spiritual Exercises, and he experienced mystic visions beginning in 1523. In the visions, it was revealed to Loyola that he was to be the originator and the master of a grand army that would do battle with what he considered Babylonian hordes. We can see that the Jesuits are a corrupt tree, which of course bears corrupt fruit, by the oath that they are to swear for initiation. And as such, anything to do with them is to be avoided at all costs. I was going to read some excerpts of the Jesuit Extreme Oath of Induction as recorded in the journals of the 62nd Congress, the United States Congressional Record. Um, however, it's, it's just far too blasphemous. Um, of course, it venerates Mary. Of course, it venerates the, the Pope, calling him holy and putting him in the place of God, of course. And it caused the superior general of the, the Jesuits, it calls him the, the ghostly father, which I find both blasphemous and just a bit weird, really. Um, of course, it talks about uh, seeking to use subtlety and subterfuge uh, to undermine governments of the world um, and to depose kings and and leaders of countries. Of course, it very specifically attacks uh, Martin Luther, um, what it calls the, the Huguenots, uh, and Calvinists, and other Protestant groups at the time. And it basically says that they are to kill um, all Protestants 
if need be and it says something about doing something horrible to their infants if need be I find the whole thing absolutely disgusting and I've decided actually that I will not read it out I have however left a link for you to read it yourself if you so wish the thing that strikes me of course is that the loving Lord Jesus Christ who told us to love our enemies and not to hinder the little children from coming to him would not have had such filth spew from his stainless lips as doing to children what is described in this oath um, it's not quite being as harmless as doves now is it um, loan the fact that the Lord told us not to swear oaths at all um, I, I feel it quite correctly identifies Jesuitism as a corrupt tree and therefore anything that comes from Jesuitism is a corrupt fruit and as believers we have a duty to be aware and to leave it and have nothing to do with it uh, the scripture comes to mind when I read this oath uh, Matthew 7:15. beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves the intent of the Jesuits and certainly the intent of Loyola who believed he he had received this call from Mary the mother of Jesus was to enact a counter-reformation as it is called to undo the work of the reformers being a man who despised the doctrines of grace Loyola saw the Protestants as the Babylonian hordes which he should exterminate from the face of the whole earth as the oath declares we certainly can know them by their fruits we should not be surprised that the Jesuits fully recognize the significance of the great debate of God's sovereignty over man's free uh, sorry God's sovereignty or man's free will in salvation this debate was the the crux of the revolution uh, the reformation sorry as Luther rightly identified it indeed the Jesuits were even playing a part in this battle for biblical truth as I shall now show in 1545 the Council of Trent was convened by Pope Paul III in this council the Catholic Church adopted a stance on justification that was blatantly contrary to the scriptures in Canon 9 of the council the church declared if anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the uh, obtaining the grace of justification and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will let him be anathema or accursed that could be I suppose during the same council the Jesuits were ordered by the Pope to make war silently and openly against the Reformation and that's exactly what we see them doing they were opposed to the doctrines of grace that God saves men whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world and said that it is man's free will and that man must cooperate in some manner I know that Arminians would strongly disagree that this is what they believe however when we look at history and when we look at the facts we can see that uh, it tells a completely different story when the papers of Archbishop Lord a self-confessed Jesuit were examined this letter was found among them dated March 1628 a Jesuit's letter sent to the rector at Brussels about the ensuing Parliament now the design of this letter was to give the superior of the Jesuits then resident at Brussels an account of the posture of civil and ecclesiastical affairs in England here is an extract of that letter father rector let not the damp of astonishment seize upon your ardent and zealous soul in apprehending the unexpected calling of a parliament we have now strings to our bow we have planted that sovereign drug Arminianism which we hope will purge the Protestants from their heresy and it flourisheth and bears fruit in due season for the better prevention of the Puritans the Arminians have already locked up the Duke of Buckingham's ears 
and we have those of our own religion which stand continually at the Duke's chamber to see who goes in and out. We cannot be too circumspect and careful in this regard. I am at this time transported with joy to see how happily all instruments and means, as well as lesser, cooperate unto our purposes. But to return unto the main fabric, our foundation is Arminianism. The Arminians and projectors, as it appears in the premises, affect mutation. This we second and enforce by probable arguments. That's taken by, uh, from Hidden Works of Darkness, page 89 and 19. For more about this, uh, please see the link uh, to an article entitled Arminianism, The Road to Rome. Uh, from this we can see quite clearly that the Jesuits believed that Arminianism was a drug that they had planted into Protestantism to undermine the uh, beliefs, which they call heresy, and that it will bear fruit in due season, and it's to undermine the Puritans, who held to, of course, the doctrines of grace. And, of course, uh, they even talk about undermining um, the Duke of Buckingham, uh, so undermining the uh, the government, the, um, the, the constitutional system of, of England at the time. And this is f to affect mutation, so this is to, to, to alter Christianity uh, to their to their end. Now, if you're a Christian and you're watching this video and you've never even heard of Arminianism, it's likely that you are um, probably going to be an Arminian because, well, most Christians they actually are. So, I'd invite you just to please uh, continue li listening uh, before you examine any of the links I'll post. Now, the doctrines that Luther was defending uh, against the attack of the Papists they are typically called Calvinism. Although, like Charles Spurgeon, I don't really feel that this term is correct. Uh, these biblical concepts are often called the doctrines of grace. Now, to quote Spurgeon, um, the doctrines of original sin, election, effectual calling, final perseverance, and all those great truths which are called Calvinism, though Calvin was not the author of them, but simply an able writer and preacher upon the subject, are, I believe, the essential doctrines of the gospel that is in Jesus Christ. However, the Counter-Reformation was a success, and the doctrines that the Jesuits sought to undermine have all but disappeared here in the UK, where I live, when the doctrines of grace are preached, they are typically promulgated by false teachers in the U.S., mixing God's sovereignty with other teachings given them and invented by the Jesuits. Um, I can think of, just as an example, uh, John MacArthur. John MacArthur is upheld as some uh, great hero of what is called Calvinism. However, the man, I mean, by any observation appears to hold to futurism and dispensationalism. Don't worry if you're not familiar with those terms. I will expound upon what they mean and show you exactly where they come from now. Now I've said that you will know the Jesuits by their fruits, but what of the fruits of Arminianism, which Lord said, Arminianism, you know, said w that it would bear in, in due season? Before this is fully examined, we have to expose another doctrine held, again, by the vast majority of supposedly Protestant Christianity today. Now we'll look at um, futurism. I mentioned futurism. And I mentioned dispensationalism. Let's look at uh, the book of Revelation now. Let's look at eschatology, because this is very important in showing the the... Uh, means and ends of the Jesuits and just how powerful they have been in undermining Protestant, uh, Protestant Christianity. Now, like I said before, if you haven't heard of Arminianism, well, actually, it probably turns out that being a Christian today, you probably are an Arminian and you had no idea. Similarly, you may very well go to a church that teaches 
some kind of futurism. I'll just expand on what I mean by that. There are typically four different ways of interpreting the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. The preterist view says that the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled in the past. Now this view is often held to by Romanists, the papists, and uh, this was developed by a Jesuit priest named Louis de Alcazar. The second is as follows. Now, uh, I'm just going to quote extensively from Wikipedia here, as any good scholar would. But before I do so, I should point out that at the time of the Reformation, uh, for a few hundred years after, and indeed to many pre-Reformation reformers, it was entirely apparent that the papacy was the Antichrist. I'm not going to present an argument in this video for that here, yeah, but um, for more information on that, on how the view became apparent and whether it is so, please see the links in the description box. I very strongly recommend it, that you do research this and examine this and pray about that. Now back to Wiki and the second way of interpreting Revelation. The view of futurism, a product of the Counter-Reformation, was advanced beginning in the 16th century in response to the identification of the papacy as Antichrist. Francisco Ribera, remember that name, a Jesuit priest, developed this theory in In Sacrum Beati Ionis Asp Apostoli and Evangelistiae Apocalypsin Commentari. His 1585 treatise on the Apocalypse of John and Saint Bellamine, remember that name as well, codified this view, giving in full the Catholic theory, theory sorry, set forth by the Greek and Latin fathers of a personal Antichrist to come just before the end of the world and to be accepted by the Jews and enthroned in the temple at Jerusalem, thus endeavouring to dispose of the exposition which saw Antichrist in the Pope. Most premillennial dispensationalists now accept Bellamine's interpretation in modified form. Widespread Protestant ident identification of the papacy as the Antichrist persisted in the USA until the early 1900s when the Schofield Reference Bible was published by Cyrus Schofield. This commentary promoted futurism, causing a decline in the Protestant identification of the papacy as Antichrist. Some U.S. futurists hold that sometime prior to the expected return of Jesus, there will be a period of great tribulation during which the Antichrist, indwelt and controlled by Satan, will attempt to win supporters with false peace and supernatural signs. He will silence all that defy him by refusing to receive his mark on their right hands or forehead. This mark will be required to legally partake in the end-time economic system. Some futurists believe that the Antichrist will be assassinated halfway through the tribulation, being revived and indwelt by Satan. The Antichrist will continue on for three and a half years following this deadly wound. In 1590, Ribera pu uh, published a commentary on the Revelation as a counter-interpretation to the prevailing view among Protestants, which identified the papacy with the Antichrist. Ribera applied all of Revelation, but the earliest chapters, to the end time rather than to the history of the church. Antichrist would be a single evil person who would be received by the Jews and would rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, that quote in particular comes from George Eldon Ladd in the Blessed Hope, a biblical study of the Second Advent and Rapture. Now, uh, another quote here is, Ribera denied the Protestant scriptural Antichrist, that comes from Second Thessalonians 2, as seated in the Church of God. He set on an infidel Antichrist outside the Church of God. That quote is by Ralph Thompson. Uh, the result of his work, Ribera's work, was a twisting and maligning of prophetic truth according to Robert Carino, uh, Carangola. So what I'm getting at with these quotes here is that basically 
1,500 years of prophetic history was just swept under the proverbial rug. Uh, uh, and uh, how could that possibly happen? Well, you see, the Jesuits had added the infamous gap. They added something called the gap theory that teaches that when Rome fell in 70 AD, prophecy just stopped. And it would only continue again right around the time of the commonly held to secret rapture. Thus the ten horns, the little horn, the beast and the antichrist have nothing to do with Christians today. According to this viewpoint, absolutely no prophecies were fil fulfilled during the Dark Ages or during all these massively momentous occasions in man's history that have occurred and will continue to occur, to occur until um, the dispensationalists and the arm, um, the um, uh, well, the, the papists, for instance, agree that the rapture will then, uh, the tribulation will then start at seven years, at the end of time. You can probably tell that I don't agree with that view by now. Now, the other two views concerning the eschatology of um, uh, the book of Revelation are the historicist view. Historicism is the belief that biblical prophecies about the little horn, the man of sin, the antichrist, the beast, and the Babylonian harlot of Revelation 17 all apply to the developing history and tribulations of Christianity, culminating at the end of time. Historicism sees these prophecies as having a direct application to papal Rome, as a system whose doctrines are actually a denial of the New Testament message of free salvation by grace through simple faith in Jesus Christ, apart from works. Historicism was the primary prophetic viewpoint of the Protestant reformers. And, uh, I mean, it, just looking at the Wikipedia article, um, of it, there, there's hardly anything about it when you're looking at the uh, the Wikipedia article for the Book of Revelation, which I find to be <laughs> quite uh, amusing. Um, there's lots about the the other two, but when it comes to historicism, it says, well, no one really believes in this anymore. Maybe the Rastafarians or the Seventh Day Adventists or something like that. And the final view, the final way of interpreting the Book of Revelation is called the uh, the spiritual or the ideal view. Um, of course this is um, so spiritual but it, it believes that the book of Revelation is just very um, ethereal and it applies to every single day of our lives. I've heard descriptions of this view particularly from one liberal Anglican vicar who seemed to hold to this view because he didn't really have a good answer. Um, his actual answer was, well, let's just try and make the book of Revelation happen every day. At which point I thought, this man clearly hasn't read the book of Revelation. Um, and of course, this is all in spite of the fact that the book of Revelation says that it is a prophecy. They just choose to ignore that bit for convenience sake, I suppose. So of the three sensible interpretations of the Revelation... Two of these have been developed by the Jesuits. They are corrupt fruit from a corrupt tree. And why were they developed? For the purpose of disguising the papacy from being identified as the Antichrist. The motivation behind them is not inspired by God's Holy Spirit, whichever way you examine the facts. This all sounds very familiar now. How could this possibly succeed, you might ask? Arminianism fed to the Protestants by the Jesuits, and that's well taken over, you could say. Futurism fed to the Protestants by the Jesuits. Taken over, you could very well argue. The Puritan Thomas Brightman expressed uh, much the same around the year 1600. He writes, But mine anger and indignation burst out against the Jesuits, for when I had by chance light upon Ribera, who made a commentary on this same holy revelation, Is it even so? said I. Do the papists take heart again? So as that book, which of a long time before, they would scarce suffer any man to touch, they, they dare now take in hand to entreat fully upon? Now they dare be bold 
and dare to proclaim to the world that any other thing rather is pointed at in that than their Pope of Rome? It was so obvious, and in truth it still is, that the papacy is the Antichrist, but it shocked Brightman to think that the Jesuits actually thought they could get away with just kicking up a smokescreen and hoping people would just forget about the papacy. And yet this is exactly what has happened. Most of Christianity today holds to Arminianism, sent out by the Jesuits to destroy the belief in the doctrines of grace, as so many Christians hold to the futurist interpretation of Revelation that was sent out by the Jesuits to misdirect attention from the Pope. But what of the fruits? Well, let's examine them. Arminianism was popularized by John Wesley, who founded Methodism in the 1700s, and he also despised the doctrines of grace, of doctrines of grace, a bit like Erasmus in that sense, I suppose. Yet he is frequently held up as a hero. John Wesley taught baptismal regeneration. Just read page 15 of the works of the Reverend John Wesley. And he also taught perfectionism and a whole host of other heresies. Uh, please see the link in the description box for a, um, a sufficient list of the heresies he taught and expounding on them. But worst of all is the placing of one's salvation in the hands of the sinner. I'll just quote him now. This decree whereby whom God did foreknow, he did predestinate, was indeed from everlasting. This, whereby all who suffer, uh, sorry, whereby all who suffer Christ to make them alive are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. I'll just repeat that. This, whereby all who suffer Christ to make them elect, sorry, to make them alive, are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. That's also in the works of the Reverend John Wesley. But you see, what, that's not what the scriptures say. It's not, oh, I'll go on then, I'll suffer Jesus to make me alive. We are dead in our sin. The scriptures tell us that we have absolutely no interest in God whatsoever. We're his absolute enemy. It's not like just picking a different flavour of ice cream. Oh, go on then, I'll just choose Jesus. The Lord says that he chooses us, not the other way around. I'd just like to quote some scriptures for you now. In Romans 3.11, it says that there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. No one. You see, because faith is a gift from God, according to Ephesians, Ephesians 2.8. It can be no other way. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And we are told just a few verses before that we can only have understanding by the moving of God's Holy Spirit. We can only receive that by believing. According to the scriptures, it can be no other way but that God saves us. Truly it is Almighty God that saves whom he wills, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, in John 6.44, no man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John Wesley and his Arminian tree of Methodism only served to further the cause outlined by the Jesuits, as I presented. Following on from Arminianism, we then see Futurism, and particularly Dispensational, and made popular by John Nelson Darby of the Plymouth Brethren in the 1800s. Also, Edward Irving, the acknowledged forerunner of both the Pentecostal and the Charismatic movements, accepted that the, the one-man antichrist idea of Bellamine and Ribera, yet he went a step further. Somewhere around 1830, Edwin, Edward Irving began to teach the, the unique idea of a two-phase return of Christ. The first phase being a secret rapture prior to the rise of the antichrist. Uh, sorry, uh, for more information on that, just please um, follow the link on screen or in the description box. I really do advise everyone to, to research these matters, please. I mean, this was all picked up by Schofield for his version of the Bible. Anyway, this is all a very brief synopsis of what happened throughout history uh, since the Reformation. But I assure you that when you actually examine the facts in more depth, you begin to see the very definite influence of Rome. 
I strongly recommend reading the article on futurism, which I've also posted a link to. See, this is exactly what happens when you allow a little leaven in. And this is exactly why the Lord Jesus Christ warned us so explicitly. The 1800s also saw the rise of cults that now have so many people in the world deceived, such as Seventh-day Adventism, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons. Many of them with doctrines that grip people so deeply, like a lar like um, large thorns dug into their flesh, so that even if they do escape the cult, they're wounded and grieved with the pain for quite some time. May God help them. Yet even though they might recognize the Pope as the Antichrist, hold to the historicist view of the Revelation, and claim to seek out all truth, as the Seventh-day Adventists do, their foundation is the sand of staunch Arminianism. And without it, the false prophecy rightly collapses. The false doctrines of Arminianism and Futurism and the other unbiblical foolishness that follow, fed to the professing church by the devil, are the reason for the division and the abundance of false doctrines, so-called denominations, and carnal Christianity that we see today. Now, I'm presenting this information to you as a call for discernment. I'm crying out to you, as men have done in times past, in the name of the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you may examine the things that I've said by the Scriptures, and in counsel with our Father. I pray that his rushing wind would blow away the chaff and all of the fog that has blinded Jesus Christ's sheep, and that a fire would burn in our hearts for the truth, that we may worship him in spirit and in truth. I used to be obsessed almost with these different conspiracy theories concerning the Illuminati, who's really controlling the world, what's really going on. But you know, the Bible has the answers. And the Bible tells us that the devil is the God, lowercase g, of this world. And he is trying to run the show. He is trying to conquer things. But within Christianity, we must understand that one day there's going to come a separation of the sheep and the goats. And that the devil is constantly trying to undermine Christianity. It's not outside of Christianity. It's within. He's trying to corrupt all that is good. All that is called good. And it's happening today. We mustn't be ignorant of it. To conclude, I'd like to read Michael Bunker's conclusion to an article entitled The Ultimate Conspiracy. Loyola's plan has come to fruition. The Jesuit doctrines of anti-grace have become the dominant teaching of the churches of the world. The woman that rides the beast, that mother of harlots, has seen her offspring grow up into maturity. The whore churches that dot every street corner have the stench of their mother. Those people who are not brain-addled and stupefied in the sugar-water harlot churches are busy decrying the evil of the coming New World Order while in ignorance they embrace the very doctrines of Antichrist. It is the ultimate conspiracy, and if it were possible, it would deceive even the very elect. Do Catholics go to heaven? You better find out, because odds are you are one. <laughs>